All right, today we're talking about underdogs. You guys know what the term underdog is, right? Underdog, it's a, it's a term, it's a word we use to uh, talk about a person or a group um, or a team that is least likely to win. Right? They're the underdog, right? They're least likely to win. They might be weaker or seem weaker. They might have less resources or seem to have less resources. Um, it's also a term used outside of competition, maybe somebody with with less power, less money than those around them, specifically compared to an opponent. And so they're the underdog. They're the one that probably won't win. But um, but we like to cheer for an underdog, don't we? It's fun. It's fun to cheer for the underdog. Um, It's interesting. I found out this term actually came from the the 1880s, referred to a dog that that got defeated in a fight back when they would do dog fights. I, I don't know what... You know, I'm not in that world. I'm, I don't know if it's still around. But uh, anyway, the losing dog was called the underdog. That's where that came from. And then 1960, some clever man or guy or group, whatever, made the cartoon, the underdog cartoon. You remember that? It was the unlikely uh, dog that came into town to save the day. And the whole line was, have no fear, underdog is here. That's right. There was this dog in a cape and he, you know, the underdog saved the day. That was pretty cool. Pretty clever. But we're not talking about that underdog or a dog that lost uh, necessarily a fight. We're talking about the underdog as in the one that is least likely to seem to win the battle. Now, there's several reasons why we like to cheer for underdog. Well, I do. Now, if my if back in the day when my kids were playing t-ball and ball, um, if if unless they were playing, I always like to uh, cheer for the visiting team because the home team has an advantage, you know, or or these guys are set to win. I always liked to root for the underdogs. There's something about that. Why? Because when they win, it makes great headlines, doesn't it? It's like, yes! You know, and then the rest of the room, you could be like, ha ha, or, you know, the other side. It, they won! Um, and the other thing is, I think, no one likes to see the same person or same team win over and over and over and over again, right? Unless it's your team, apparently, but we like it when the team comes up and we're like, out of nowhere, it's a win! You know, it's like fun to see that happen. The other thing that we like to, and I like to cheer for the underdog, is because the underdog, when the underdog becomes the champion, they win, it's a story of redemption. It's a story that shows that although they looked weak, they were strong enough to win. And there's something about that story of redemption in an underdog winner that just connects with us. And now, by the way, there's some really good movies out there that are about the underdogs, and these are specifically, I'm gonna name a couple that are specifically in the sports arena. So you have uh, an ice, um, ice hockey back in, uh, when was it, the, in 1980s, when the US overturned um, the Soviet Union. There's a, mer- there, it's called Miracle. That's a great movie. Rudy is a good movie of an uh, underdog. Um, Remember the Titans is another football movie, an, an underdog movie. The Jackie Robinson story, Cinderella Man, that's a boxer one. Uh, these are great underdog movies about somebody who's least likely, but yet gains the upper hand and eventually wins. They're, they're inspiring, aren't they, these movies? If you haven't seen these, they're pretty cool. But the Bible is full of underdog stories as well. You're probably already thinking of some that are in your mind. Think about Peter in the New Testament. Small town fisherman turned apostle of Jesus Christ for the gospel. How about Paul? This feared and violent imprisoner of Christians turned dynamic missionary for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What about Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he a tax collector turned to be a thankful and generous lad. How about Moses? Moses was a stuttering murderer who turned to be the leader of the Israelites and he took Pharaoh head on. But the one that probably comes to mind over all of them is which one? He's probably all in your mind. David and Goliath, that's right. Now, the story of David and Goliath is found in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel 17, and I'm going to give you highlights of this story. I'm not going to go through and read the whole thing, but in 1 Samuel, you'll find this story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath is such a famous story that actually the term itself is used in modern day. Like, well, that's a David and Goliath situation if I ever saw one, you know, or he seems to be a Goliath of a man. I mean, he's, he's still ring true today. But this story tells us of a young shepherd boy named David who defeated a giant warrior named Goliath with a simple sling and a stone. 
Now, in the story that we find, we find the Philistine army are facing off with the Israelite army. The Philistine army, for our purposes, are the bad guys. Okay, They are opposing the army of God, the armies of God, the Israelites. The Israelites are on this side. They are God's army, capital G. And they're facing off to the Philistines. But they're at a standstill. Each one of them on either side of this valley are every morning they line up, get ready for battle. But in the middle of this time, there would be one warrior from the Philistine army that would come out, and it was Goliath. He would come out each day. He was a champion warrior, a killing machine, over nine feet tall. His body armor and his swords and everything weighed over 100 pounds. Over 100 pounds. He had his own guy that would carry the shield for him. The guy was just an amazing war machine. He comes out every day and taunts the Israelites. And basically, fee fi fo fum send out a guy to destroy me. And if he wins, we're yours. That's it. Battle over. One, uh, one man against another man. But if I win, then we have victory over your entire army. Well, this brought the, the, uh, the army of the Israelites shaken in their boots. I mean, they were like, I'm not taking this guy on. Are you kidding me? He's never wa- lost a fight. I'm not going to go up against him. And so this is where we find the story of David. In fact, Goliath went out and he mocked the Israelite army and their God. And, he's, and it, no one dared to face him, but he said this. He came out one morning. He says, why are, you, why are you guys coming out to fight? He called. I'm the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me, and if he kills me, these are his words, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, we'll be yours. Did I say that right? Yeah, do that for me, okay? Yeah, you got it. I defy the armies of Israel today. I mean, he's like drawing a really hard line in the sand there. Remember, he's talking about the capital G God. And he says, send me a man who will fight. Day after day. One day, a shepherd boy named Shepherd, I keep saying Moy, Shepherd Moy. I don't know what that is, but I know what a shepherd boy is. A shepherd boy named David shows up, and he brings, he's uh, bringing some treats from, from Dad, Jesse, to his other brothers who are there on the front lines on the Israelite side. And as he's greeting his brothers, remember, he's a shepherd back home, and as he's greeting his, his brothers who are in the army, he hears this fee fi fo fum nonsense. He's like, whoa, hold on a second. You know, back that beep, 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 back that up. Did you just hear what he said? He's defying our God. I can't believe, I can't believe this. You guys are just standing here. Some, we got to do something about it. I'm going to go fight that guy. Now, remember, this is an untrained shepherd boy, as far as untrained for Saul's army. And they're all just going, uh, dude, I don't know. I mean, he's pretty big, and he's, he's never lost a fight, and this and that. He's like, oh, no, I'm doing this. Well, word gets to the king. And the king is like reluctant. He's like, I don't think you should do that. You know, bad idea. You're a shepherd. He's a giant. Like, it's not going to turn out so well. He's like, no, I'm going to do this. So reluctantly, Saul goes, okay, but here's my armor. He tries the armor on and it doesn't fit. It's all, you know, it doesn't work for him. So he takes it off and he's like, I got this. God has allowed me to kill lion and bear to protect my sheep. God will go with me. And God will give us victory. Really? Okay. There you go. Go for it. So he goes out and he faces off against Goliath. Now, I like word pictures here. So I need somebody to read the statement that Goliath yelled out when David faced off with him. Do I have a volunteer that would want to come up here and read Goliath's statement? Do I have anybody? I have it written for you here. Anybody? Your mom says you should. Anybody? Okay. All right. Yes. Andrew, my man. Give it up for Andrew. All right. All right. By the way, Andrew, how you doing? This is my good friend, uh, Andrew. He is my son, Luke's good friend, Andrew. And uh, what a bold step, bro. This is awesome. Okay. Look what I got for you. Isn't this great? Look at that. I know. Hey, don't. Be careful, (laughs) mighty warrior. All right. So this is an exact replica. No. Just kidding. This thing is, this thing could give you a paper cut. It's so sharp. It's because it is made out of paper. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Careful. All right. Let me get you a mic over here. All right. You're going to stand on the edge of this platform like some Goliath. 
Uh, stand right there. Okay. And I'm going to be David. That's that's hot. We got to turn that down a little bit. I'm going to go down here. Oh, you need something to read, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Your hands are full. All right. I'm going to take my notes. Go down here. And you're Goliath. <laughs> I don't think Goliath smiled, by the way. I don't... There you go. That's... <laughs> now you're scary. Oh, yeah. Don't do that. All right. So David enters the scene. Goliath, with his spear, yells out to David. Go ahead. Am I a dog? Wow, he's good. <laughs> that you come out here with this stick? Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. <laughs> oh, ah! <laughs> That's pretty good. <clears throat> Now it's David's turn, Mr. Goliath. David says, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God, capital G, of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Huh? What do you think about that? Before you respond, let me finish. And then I'll give you... you know, the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, drop the mic. All right, that's right, yeah, woo! All right, so here's how the story goes. Goliath is probably probably charging at him, which you can just stay right there. <laughs> okay. And coming after the shepherd boy, and what he does is he takes his sling and and a rock that he had gathered out of a stream. It says, the text says he had five rocks that he had gathered at a nearby little stream, put them in his little satchel, took one of them, and with amazing precise accuracy, flung that rock, and it hit Goliath right in the forehead. And he literally just came, just kaboom, just went right to the ground. David went up there, and just as he promised, took his sword, cut off his head, and they chased the Philistine army and had victory over them that day because the God, capital G, won that victory through a small little shepherd boy, even over a mighty giant named Andrew, I mean Goliath. Is that right? Anyway, give it up for my uh, volunteer here. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And that, the notes, yeah. Oh, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to go back up here. Now, this, the story of David and Goliath is quite an underdog story, isn't it? It really is. Um, and many see this as a lesson in courage or a lesson in faith, a lesson in, you know, with God, all things are possible. Many see themselves as David, an example of David that maybe been defeated by so many giants in their lives, and they're saying, Lord, redeem this. Turn this around. Now, I like that. But I actually don't see David as an example for you and me in this story. You see, yes, the Lord allows us to defeat the giants in our lives, but we're not represented as David here. David's not a representation of us. If you stand back from the story of David and Goliath, there's a much bigger story that emerges from the text. David is a foreshadowing of somebody much, much greater. God's champion, Jesus Christ. Jesus shows up on earth from the same place, actually, that David was from, Bethlehem. He also was of lowly profession. He was despised by his brothers and looked weak in the eyes of the leaders around him. But Jesus veiled his glory in humanity. The story of David and Goliath points to a greater story of Scripture, that God sent his son who took on our human nature. David shows up and he lines up with all the other warriors and he's going, hey guys, what's going on? Jesus shows up in human flesh into our world and steps into this world fully divine, fully God and human. He took on our nature. And what does Jesus do? Jesus confronts and defeats the greatest enemy, Satan himself. 
At the cross, Jesus disarms the power of rebellion. And at the cross, Jesus brings victory to all who believe in him as Lord and Savior. Now the truth is that the enemy, the spiritual Goliath in our lives today, doesn't or never did stand a chance against Jesus, the anointed one. He never stood a chance. It's not at all a underdog story. Jesus is the mighty victor. He rules and reigns from on high. And when he came down and stepped into this world, he stepped in already the champion. And when he rose from the grave, he was literally given the ribbon of first place that he had already had when he stepped into this world. In the story of the underdogs, of David and Goliath, I actually see the underdogs as the army of Israel. You know, on this side, they're lined up against the Philistines. They're scared. They, they feel like their resources aren't big enough. They feel like they're not strong enough. And they don't even have one guy that can beat Goliath. They were the underdogs. And if I look at this story, I believe that we find ourselves as the army of Israel, that we're the underdogs. Why? Because we're standing on the sidelines watching our champion move out and defeat their warrior. That's just what Jesus did. When he came to this earth and died on the cross, he did that for your sins and mine. See, we couldn't step out and defeat that because it's not within our ability. But Jesus, who's the perfect replacement for your sin and mine, even though he had not sinned, he was the one that took on sin and death and he had died on the cross, but he rose again. As I was studying for this, I came across a Bible scholar who went to the talking about the similarities between David and Goliath and the story of Jesus in the gospel. He went as far as to say is that, you know, David, he gathered up five stones and put them in his little pouch. And with one of them, he defeated Goliath. And how that's a symbolism and it points to the five wounds of Jesus Christ. Two in his hands, one in his feet, the crown of thorns, and the one on his side. And that what defeated sin and death was when he rose from the grave, showing that his power was greater than the enemy's. We find ourselves there watching the Lord. Here's the thing. It seems, though, that the enemy of our soul, Satan, when he tempts us to sin and when we sin, that sin, we feel defeated by it. We feel powerless. We feel that it's buckled us at the knees that we don't have any future in this, that there's no strength, there's no championship going to win here. I'm done. But the reality is Jesus is our champion. He has fought the battle for us. He has won for us. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have access to the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. And that's why the battle, the Israelites won the army, even though the shepherd boy wasn't even in the army. They won because he won he is their champion. Jesus Christ is our champion. And when we follow after him, we have access to that in our daily lives and for eternity in heaven. While Jesus was on this earth, John, one of his disciples, recorded something that he said, a very powerful statement. He says, in this world, you're going to have problems. You're going to have suffering. You're going to have it. It's actually one of the promises of Jesus. You're going to have problems. In fact, trouble, he uses the word trouble in a translation. But then he says this, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I find this very interesting because he's pointing to us and saying, you're going to have trouble, but I've overcome the world. So that should take heart. That should relieve you of that, that tension of all is lost. How is it that when Jesus says, I've overcome the world, but you have problems, how does that relieve that tension? Because when we follow after him and he is our Lord and Savior, just like I said before, we have access to the power of God in our lives and sin is defeated in us. We are forgiven and the Lord redeems us. We become an underdog story, a champion, only through Jesus. Now John, the Apostle John, who heard Jesus say that and wrote that down, in his letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he actually brings this back up. He says this, 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Remembering this powerful statement, he reminds us again, he says, for every child of God defeats this evil world. 
I'm going to say that again. For every child of God, it defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Now, wait a minute. He asked the question that he already answered. He said before, for every child of God defeats this world, and we have this victory through faith. But then he asked the question, who wins this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There it is. That's the connection. Faith. Faith is our connection from the trouble in this world to victory that Jesus promises. It's faith in him. Four quick points as we finish this morning. And you're going, four, finish? Those two don't go together, do they? <laughs> Just go with it, okay? The Apostle Paul reminds us of four powerful truths. Number, fir- the, number first. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure you're awake here. <laughs> When you believe and follow Jesus, you become a child of God. When you believe and follow Jesus, you become a child of God. Now, that's very important because when we're born of God, we have this relationship where he is our father. And as him is our father, we have access to who the father is. Now, this relationship is not a one and done. It's not, well, I said yes to Jesus on a Sunday. Guess what? He walks with you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and again the next week. That means that we have to continue to walk in step with this new relationship. The second powerful truth is that children of God defeat the evil world. So if you believe in Jesus, you are a child of God. And if you're a child of God, guess what? You get to defeat the evil world. Other translations use the word overcome. We can overcome the world. We then live out this underdog story. We become champions through who? Who's the answer? Jesus. That's right. The goal of the believer is not to win by the world's standards. By the way, the world has its standards of winning. They say, well, winning means I finally make more money. I finally got the promotion. I'm finally well known. You know, I was on the bottom, but finally I'm at the top. You know, I had this job, but now I have a better job, a bigger job. You know, I finally get the pretty girl. I finally get the heartsome heartthrob. heart throb of a man. That didn't come out very easily. They, we finally reach one million subscribers. Whatever it might be, the world's standards win is different. The win in God's standards is a faith that lasts. As a champion, as a believer, we gain victory over the sinful patterns of the world through our faith in Jesus Christ. It's a day by day trusting and obeying in Him. It's really cool. The original language of this word overcome or defeat in this text is not just a one-time thing. It's not the champion in these movies we've been talking about that just one good sucker punch and the guy's out and he becomes a champion. He's a one-time champion. It's not that. This verb actually is a continual overcoming. In the original text, it's overcoming and again overcoming and again overcoming. What does that mean? Is that we are always overcoming when we have a faith in Jesus Christ. That's good for you and I, by the way, because we need that daily, don't we? Thirdly is we achieve victory only through faith. Faith is more powerful than we understand. The world says that victory is achieved by what you do. You work hard, you get it, you win. But in God's, in the kingdom world, Jesus says with faith, you can move a mountain. It's faith that allows us to have victory in our lives. And lastly, you will only win the battle with faith in Jesus. Jesus has complete authority and dominion over the universe, this world. He has power over all matter and all spiritual forces. He has overcome. And because he has overcome, we who have faith in him will also overcome. Just want to ask you a couple questions as we finish this morning. First, have you begun that relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you said, God, I recognize that you have a plan for me, but I also know that I've sinned, and that's distanced this, this me, me from you. But Jesus, you stepped in, you defeated, and I have faith in you. The Word of God says to us that when we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that he raised from the dead, we will be saved. And that anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Guess what that means? Any of us and all of us at any moment can say, yes, Jesus, 
I want to serve and follow after you. Take me, and he does. It's powerful news. And it doesn't stop there. It's a continual walk with the Lord. So first, have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you have, then are you trusting him every day to be your overcomer? Every day, are you walking with him? Are you a man or a woman of prayer? Are you a man or a woman of God's word? Are you, do you have people who are encouraging you in the faith? And are you seeking the Lord? I love the fact that if we seek him, we'll find him. The other questions maybe of application is, are there voices of the enemy that are taunting you and keeping you from moving in a direction that God has for you? Can I remind you right now that those voices are the enemy's voices and Jesus has gone before you. He's defeated the enemy. And so follow behind him. That's key. Follow behind him. And allow him to bring about the redemptive story in your life so that you can move forward Don't listen to the lies of the enemy, that you are worthless, that because of your sin, that you have been disqualified. Rather, Jesus qualifies us because we're forgiven and we have faith in him. What areas of your life do you feel you've been defeated in, that you are, need to know that Jesus has gone before you and he has won and fought the battle for you? And I just encourage you, trust him in those areas. And ask him, Lord, how do I continue to have freedom and redemption in these areas? And are you ready and willing to allow God's strength to give you victory? Are you trusting him for that every day? I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes just as a mere thing, just to focus our hearts on prayer. And as we pray this I'm sure that the Lord is speaking to different things in your life. I'd encourage you right now in this moment of prayer just to reach out to God in prayer. and Whatever it is that he's moving in your heart, it could be forgiveness, it could be thankfulness, it could be for restoration. God hears your prayer. He listens and he responds. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, we want to pray with you this morning. And if that's you, the prayer is this. And I will pray it in just a minute. In fact, we're all going to pray it together. But the prayer is this. God, I know you have a plan for me. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you rose again, and I'm going to follow you. Thank you for salvation right now and for allowing me to be a part of your kingdom, your family. I want to follow you. That's the prayer. If you want to make that prayer today, I invite every one of us to pray that together. In fact, I'm going to ask all the Pursuit Church family to repeat this prayer with those that are praying this this morning. Just repeat this out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I know that you love me. I know that you have a great plan for me. And I admit that I have messed up. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you for forgiveness right now. Thank you for salvation right now. I choose to follow you. And I believe that you died on the cross for me. And that you rose again. And you are the champion. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. We want to celebrate with you. This may be a bold move, but we believe it's an important part of our relationship with Jesus. But if you just gave your life to Jesus Christ this morning and you want to confess that, we just ask, put your hand up and say, that's me, I gave my life to Jesus, and we're going to celebrate with you. Anybody here this morning that gave their life to the Lord, we want to just celebrate with you. Anybody? All right, well, if you're too shy to lift your hand up, please go tell somebody. Come up to me after the service. We have a prayer team that's going to come up right now and pray with anybody that wants to. You can come share that news with them. We also have, um, I believe that Robert's going to be at the Welcome Center. If you want to take some steps forward in your faith and you're not sure what that looks like and you want to get a Bible or you need some encouragement, then he'll be there to talk with you as well. Take advantage of this opportunity to get prayer or direction in your life with Jesus Christ. We just want to encourage you in that way uh, because God loves you and man, we love you too. We're so excited about this decision. 
But tell somebody if you gave your life to Jesus this morning. And if you're still in search for him, you will find him. So come back and uh, ne this next week and talk to him all week. He's listening. Amen? Amen? May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. You are sent. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to Him and give you a better understanding of His Word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.